right, so good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome in from across the continent and beyond. My name is Jesse, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got some new faces in the crowd today, including a grade 12 class. We don't get them very often. And so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world through 45 monthly live free interactive broadcasts. You can check out everything we do on our YouTube channel, too. Over 2,500 past programs there. Now, this is thrilling to me for a couple of reasons today, because we like to feature a lot of stories of wildlife, nature, conservation. We get astronauts, engineers, all sorts of stuff. But once or twice a year, we have a very unique program, and that is with Dr. John Donahue from the Institute for Quantum Computing. They have an Instagram page that actually talks about teleportation with a straight face, which I think is a really uh, a good sign of how cool the science that they do there is. And I really want to say for our students, whether you're in grade 6, 12, kindergarten, whatever, uh, if you can find something in your life that you are as excited about as John is about sharing this world with audiences like you, uh, you're pretty set. So John, it's so nice to have you back, man. I'm so excited to dive in. I encourage our audience to check out all the amazing stuff you do on your website and Instagram page. Uh, but if you want to dive in and take us away, let's do this. Absolutely. Thing. Thank you so much for the very kind introduction, Jesse, and thank you everyone for joining today. So my name is John Donahue from the Institute for Quantum Computing. We're a research institute at the University of Waterloo. And yeah, today we're going to be doing some experiments in the quantum realm. So before we dive into it, just a little bit about myself. So my background is in physics. I got into physics not because I knew that's what I wanted to do when I was growing up, but because I thought it was a pretty fun class in high school, to be honest. Uh, I like the idea of, you know, using mathematics to understand the natural world. So what I did was I got into a physics program and I thought I really wanted to be a theoretical quantum physicist. I really like the idea of, okay, what can we do with the mathematics uh, of the universe to really understand the universe? You know, have these kind of big pictures of these giants of physics in my head. And most of them are studying theoretical physics. So I thought, hey, let's, let's do theoretical physics. And what I did was I was very lucky. I was in what's called a co-op program. That means that I could do research alongside my study and the first thing I did was got a co-op in theoretical quantum physics. Thought, yeah, it's going to be really cool. And realized right away that I am not cut out to be a theoretical quantum physicist. I want to be clear, not because the math is too hard or anything. The math of quantum mechanics is a lot easier than some of the other things that you might encounter in physics and engineering. It's really not that terrible. But I didn't have the focus for it. What I really like to do was play around with experiments, get my hands dirty. So I switched from that and uh, became a experimental quantum physicist. So, uh, and that's what I really love to do to this day. And today we're going to be doing a lot of experiments about quantum physics. Okay, so yeah, this is a little bit about myself. Uh, I got my PhD in 2016. My research background is using big lasers and using them to measure the smallest particle of light we have imaginable, something called a photon. Uh, now, by day, I do a lot of work in quantum outreach and education. Uh, in some of these photos, you can see some of the labs that I've worked on uh, before in the past. So these are using very, very powerful lasers, somewhat dangerous lasers, but we know how to work with them, uh, and using them to generate special kind of light that we need quantum physics to describe and then making the right measurements to show something about how the universe works. Uh, now, since then, I focus more on quantum outreach by day. Uh, by night, I mostly hang out with this big fluffy monster right here. Uh, his name's Murphy. He's a big old labradoodle, and uh, he's my best friend. <laughs> okay, so before we kind of dive into it, uh, I'd like to know that today is World Quantum Day. So April 14th, this is the third International World Quantum Day. Uh, a group of academics, researchers from around the world uh, kind of came together and said, yes, this is the day that we want to really celebrate quantum technology, celebrate some of the advances in quantum information science and how that might be used to build new kinds of technologies. So it's every year on April 14th. Uh, that's because 4.14, uh, if you add about 15 zero at a point decimal point and then 15 zeros and then 414 uh that's planck's constant in units of electron volt seconds uh and yeah so it's planck's constants one of the fundamental constants of quantum mechanics it what def it's what defines the energy scale of the universe the kind of the pixel size of the universe if you will uh and yeah so uh today is a good day to learn about quantum mechanics celebrate quantum mechanics and start thinking about what quantum mechanics is so i've already said the word quantum mechanics I don't even know how many times, but uh, so it's probably a good time to talk about just what quantum mechanics is. 
So what is quantum? Uh, just a quick note, I don't think I can see my face on this side, just making sure because I do a lot of hand talking. Uh, but quantum, when, pe what, when people first encounter quantum, they might think about something like Ant-Man. So in Ant-Man, he's a superhero. He can make himself very, very big and very, very small. And if he makes himself smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually he reaches something called the quantum realm. Now in Ant-Man in Quantum Realm, basically all the rules of the universe they go right out the window. Uh, he can do things like harvest infinite energy. He can do things like communicate over very, very long distances instantaneously. Uh, he can do things like, for some reason, encounter vast alien civilizations. So this is what happens in the quantum realm in Ant-Man. And Ant-Man, for the record, I enjoy those movies. I think they're quite fun. But one thing about it irks me a little bit, and that's because... Quantum mechanics is not a world that doesn't have any rules. In fact, the rule book of quantum mechanics is incredibly well understood and incredibly well tested. So quantum mechanics is really the rule book of the sub-microscopic universe. It's what describes the world of things like atoms and electrons and photons. It helps us predict their behavior. And it is by far the most successful theory of physics that we've developed so far. Every test that we've tried to throw at quantum mechanics, quantum mechanics has given us the correct answer. Okay, it gives us tools and it gives us the rules that we can use. Uh, so the rules are sometimes a little bit different than the rules that we use in normal physics of the world around us. But it does use tools like the uncertainty principle and the Schrodinger equation. If we can understand these rules, we can use them to predict behavior at the fundamental level. It just happens to sometimes defy our intuition. Now, understanding quantum mechanics has already enabled many important technologies. So quantum mechanics is not particularly new. It's been around since the early 1900s. And by the time we got past the Second World War, we were already using it to build new technologies. Things like the MRI machine. What an MRI machine does is it takes an image of the inside of your body in a non-invasive manner. And it does that by using a quantum property that the electrons and atoms inside your body have called quantum spin. If it weren't for our understanding of quantum mechanics, we would never be able to build an MRI machine. Things like the laser. If we didn't understand how atomic energy levels were populated and repopulated, we wouldn't be able to build something like lasers. That's a pure technology that relies on our understanding of quantum mechanics. Now, what is kind of new is some popular modern research, which focuses on something called quantum computing. Okay, and that's where we're going to take these strange rules of quantum mechanics, these sometimes non-intuitive rules, and apply them to problems in computer science and how we solve problems uh, computationally. Okay, so before we talk about what a quantum computer is, I want to take like one more step back and I just want everyone to think for a second about what a computer is. Okay, so try to imagine that you were at your some someone who had never seen a computer before in their life was asking, hey, what is this box? How would you define what a computer does? Okay, think about that for a couple seconds. I'm going to freely admit, I'm a physicist by trade. I'm not a computer engineer or a computer scientist. Computers, the ones that I'm using to present right now, they're pretty much magic to me. What goes on in there is is very complicated. And you know the fact that it works is incredibly impressive and magical when I start thinking about it. Any sufficiently advanced technology just seems like magic. But fundamentally what's going on in there is I'm giving my computer some information. There is some circuitry that goes on that's shaking up that information and uh, eventually it's going to give me an answer. So maybe I want to know what three times five is. So I tell my computer three times five. Some magic happens and all of a sudden I get the answer 15. I tell my computer I want to see a picture of a dog. Some magic happens and all of a sudden I get a JPEG corresponding to a dog. So what a computer is doing is it's processing information I give it to give me a useful answer. So perhaps my input is the numbers three and five. I want to know what three times five is. I give it, I give it the numbers three and five. Three and five, those are useless numbers to me. I already know what three and five are. What I want to know is what three times five is, and the computer is going to tell me that. I already know what the word dog means. What I want is a picture of a dog and the computer is going to take my input and give me the output that I want. It's going to take my useless information and give me back useful information. Okay. Now, a quantum computer is something very, very similar. So a quantum computer is what we can think about as a quantum information processor. I give it some input and I still get some output. I have a question, I get, still get an answer out. 
But what's going on in the middle, the kind of magic inside the box, instead of obeying the rules of classical computing, instead of using things like AND gates and OR gates and NOT gates, we're using different kinds of operations to process the information in a different way. We're essentially taking advantage of some of these non-intuitive rules of quantum mechanics and using them to solve problems more efficiently. So at places like the Institute for Quantum Computing, we are looking at using, uh, figuring out what rules of quantum mechanics we can take advantage of, how we can use them to solve real problems, and how we can actually build these devices to give us some kind of advantage in how we compute and process information. So that's kind of the big goal of all this research. And a question to ask would be, what rules can we actually use? So the first one I'd like to talk a little bit about is something in quantum mechanics called wave-particle duality. Okay? So when we talk about waves and particles, whether we think of something as a particle or a wave can depend on its properties. Okay, so think about some things that you would classify as a particle, uh, like, so for example, grains of sand or tennis balls, and some things that you would classify as waves, things like sound waves or water waves. Well, things that we think about particles, they tend to exist in only one place. They have properties like mass and volume. If I have two particles that bounce into each other, well, they're going to kinetically collide with each other. And if I have a bunch of particles, I can count them one by one. If I'm thinking about waves instead, well, maybe they exist over a very large space. Instead of having properties like weight and volume, they have properties like wavelength and frequency. If I have two waves that meet each other, instead of bouncing off each other, they interfere with each other. And instead of having being able to count the waves, I can continuously adjust them from all the way off to very intense and anywhere in between. Okay, so we might think about particles, something like you know, sand or tennis balls or cannonballs, and waves like water waves. Okay, so I want to focus on one of these properties in particular, something called wave interference for a second. So if we have waves, if I drop a, say I drop a rock in a pond, we're going to see waves that spread out in a circular formation around that rock. Okay, now let's think about what happens if I instead drop two rocks in a pond at the same time. So I throw my two rocks in a pond, and there's going to be some waves that are generated from the first rock, some waves that are generated from the second rock, and those two waves, well, they're going to keep spreading out until they meet each other. And when they do, we're going to see something called interference. If the waves meet and they're both waving up and down kind of at the same rate, like when one's up, the other one's also up, we're going to get what we call constructive interference. We're going to get an even bigger wave at the end. If the waves are going such that when one's at the high point, the other's at the low point, they're actually going to cancel each other out. We call this destructive interference. We can see that in this image here. We see an even bigger wave. So we have our two kind of rocks dropped in the pond here. And we see an even bigger wave at certain points. That's our constructive interference. But then we get lines like this where there's just no interference whatsoever. That's our destructive interference. So the fact that waves, when they interfere, can either add up together or subtract from each other is a fundamental property of waves. Okay? So there was a big, big, big question in the kind of early 1800s, which was, was light a wave or a particle? Okay? So we had to find some way to solve this. Uh, there was, you know, no real strong evidence one way or the other at that point. Uh, so what Thomas Young did, and a scientist in the early 1800s, was he took a beam of light and shined it through two narrow openings that we call slits. So light could go through one slit on the top or one slit on the bottom. Now, when light encounters these very narrow openings, and by narrow, I'm talking about a fraction of a millimeter wide, it's going to expand rapidly beyond that slit. So if we have light encountering this slit, it's going to spread itself out. And if it encounters this other slit, it's also going to spread itself out. This is very much like our dropping rocks in a pond example. And if we look in the very, very far field, if we look far away from the slits, if it's behaving like a particle, we should just see a bunch of light, a smear of light. But if it's behaving like a wave, we would expect to see wave-like interference, similar to our rock example. This was actually a really hard experiment to do in the early 1800s, but now it's incredibly easy to do because we have very nice sources of light, these laser pointers that we can get from the dollar store. 
And we can do this experiment, and this is an image of what we see. We do the experiment with a laser pointer. We see these very, very clear regions of constructive and destructive interference. So we can look at an experiment like this and convince ourselves that yes, light is indeed a wave. Okay? So that's one part of the story. Light behaves like a wave. We see this wave-like interference. But there's a second part of the story as well. And this is the birth of quantum mechanics, was the discovery that light is actually made up of individual units that we call photons. So at the quantum scale, uh, we can only have something like zero photons or one photon or two photons. We can never have half a photon or pi photons. It's always these integer zero, one, two, three, four steps. Okay, so that means effectively that we can count light. Now, we don't normally notice this because the amount of light in a photon is something like a millionth of a trillionth of the amount of light that we interact with in the world around us. So it's just, it's too small for us to see. But we can do experiments today that actually use one photon at a time. And now a natural question would be to ask, can we still see wave-like interference even if we can count the photons of light? So this is an experiment that was done at IQC about 10 years ago, and we can see something that looks like this. So each dot here corresponds to exactly one photon being detected, one particle of light, one countable particle of light. Now, it doesn't look like much at the first. We shine it through a two-slit apparatus, similar as before, and we see, okay, if we let it build up and build up, we're very likely to find the photons here, very unlikely to find the photons here, very likely to find the photons here, and so on and so forth. We seem to get these regions where we're more likely to find photons and regions where we're less likely to find photons. What we conclude from this is that yes, light is countable like a particle, but we can still see interference like we can see a wave, like we can see with waves. So is light a wave or a particle? In some waves it behaves like a wave, in other ways it behaves like a particle. Waves and particles are concepts that we have to kind of forget about when we go to the quantum realm, because there are some ways that light behaves that remind us of waves and some ways that remind us of particles. We call this wave-particle duality. Okay, and this experiment really shows it nicely when we think about light, individual units, individual photons of light. Now, one of the most interesting things, though, is that this doesn't apply just to light. So I'm going to switch over to a demo now real quickly, where we're going to see how this works with electrons. So we have with us an electron diffraction tube. It looks like something like this in the bright light. We have to do it in the dark to make sure that we can see the effect we're looking for. But this is what it looks like when we really light it up. Uh, inside the back of the tube, we have a little cathode, so something that we're going to heat up. And that when it, we heat it up, it's going to start emitting electrons. Electrons are going to get energy, they're going to get excited, and they're going to free from the metal, and they're going to fly out into space. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put them through a big electric field, we're going to give them some energy, speed them up, and we're going to ha have them hit a metal sheet that's going to cause them to spread out, similar to the slit. And we're going to see uh, the electrons on the fluorescent screen. So on the very back of it, every time an electron hits that screen, it's going to glow green. So I'm going to switch over to that camera so we can see that in action. All right. Just going to roll over a bit here. Hopefully you can see my hand there. How's it going, everyone? Hey, so, John. We can. I'm just letting you know we're all good. <laughs> and, okay, perfect. So this right here is my electron diffraction tube here. I'm going to start powering it up with my power source at the back down here. Right now, uh, yeah, if we look really close here, we can see a little bit of red from the cathode. You might not be able to see that on the camera, but right there, that's glowing red hot. That's our electrons being heated up. I'm just gonna move this a bit so that we don't get too much interference there. And if I start turning up the power, we eventually start seeing some green appear here. So this green, this little dot right here, that is electrons hitting a fluorescent screen and causing it to glow green. Now, a lot of people, when they see this, think, hey, you're probably just using a laser pointer. You're tricking me somehow. So what I have here is a magnet. And if I have electrons, they're charged particles. If I hold a magnet up to them, they deflect. Okay? So we're definitely working here with particles that have some charge. No trick, no laser pointer happening here. Now, I'm going to keep giving it a little bit more energy. And we see we give the electrons more energy. They start colliding on the screen. There's more electrons, so it gets brighter and brighter and brighter. And now, right now, it's so bright that the camera can't really see it. So I'm going to put something up in front of the camera so that it dims the image a bit. And if we get to right around there, there it's nice and crisp and sharp, we can see that ring feature, right? 
that ring feature right there. That's something we can see very, very clearly. And that is interference. So we see some regions, those bright bands where we can very clearly see electrons, but other regions where none of the electrons seem to be landing at all. The way we mathematically describe that is very similar to how we describe light. The electron is behaving like a wave and we're seeing constructive and destructive interference. Not with light, not with light waves, but actually with electrons one by one introducing that interference. Okay, so I'll go back to the slides just in case you had a hard time seeing that. We do have a better image, a better still image of it right here where we see those rings of interference. Oh, just going to turn off my electron tube before it gets a little too hot. And then I'm coming right back. Okay, so that's interference with electrons one by one by one. Okay, now th this is not the only way we can see interference. There was an experiment done here that we can see where they saw that double slit interference, but with electrons instead. And indeed, you can see interference with even larger things like atoms. So this is an experiment from 1999 where they showed interference with buckyballs, these atoms made of 60 carbon atoms. So everything that we can think of at the quantum scale, it can behave like particles in some ways, but in other very real ways, they behave like waves. Okay, so atoms and electron beams are from hot sources, but actually most so, and we saw that we had to heat up that coil to emit those electrons, but most quantum experiments run at ultra cold temperatures. And that's what I like to talk about for the, for the rest of the discussion here is talking about how we can do things at these ultra, ultra, ultra cold temperatures. Okay, so before we get into that, of course, we got, should take a step back and just think for a second about what is temperature. Okay, so what does temperature mean at the level of molecules and atoms? Okay, well, temperature, we know we can measure it using things like the Celsius scale. Uh, we have handy markers like at zero degrees Celsius ice melts, at 100 degrees Celsius water boils. But at the molecular level, what this corresponds to is a measure of thermal energy. It's a measure of excitation. It's a measure of like how much... Think about it like vibrational energy for the molecules. If I give the molecules and atoms more energy, they're going to have a higher temperature. They're going to be more chaos. They're going to be flying around everywhere. If they're colder, they're going to be more chilled out, more relaxed. Okay. We can think about this with balloons, for example. So if I take a balloon and put it near a candle, I heat it up. The energy of the atoms inside that balloon, the air molecules, that increases. The pressure inside the balloon increases. Think about it as the atoms inside the balloon are now running against the edge of the balloon more wildly and kind of pressing against the outside, expanding the balloon. And that is what we ultimately see. The balloon expands. Now, if instead we put the balloon near an ice cube, well, the heat, the temperature is going to decrease. The energy of the atoms effectively decreases. The pressure, the amount of energy they can expend by hitting the edge of the balloon that decreases and what we see is that the balloon deflates okay so let's take another look at the camera uh one second while i set this up but let's see what happens when we cool down a balloon to really 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 cold temperatures so you might have seen this before uh an effect that you might have heard about is when we have car tires and when we look at car tires in the winter they tend to deflate a little bit the pressure inside the tire goes down a bit and you know, that's looking at temperature variations on the scale of what we encounter in our day-to-day -day life. But if we look at temperature variations that are quite extreme, we can see these effects much more dramatically. So what I have inside this box right here is liquid nitrogen. So as we mentioned, at 100 degrees Celsius, water boils. At zero degrees Celsius, water freezes. Liquid nitrogen boils at a about negative 200 degrees Celsius. So very, very cold. So what's inside this box right here is kept at about negative 190 or so, between negative 190 and negative 210 degrees Celsius. It boils off at what's called 77 Kelvin. So inside this box, we have something incredibly cold. In fact, I should probably be wearing gloves when I get, when I start touching it, okay? And what I have here is a balloon that's nice and happy at room temperature. So what's going to happen if I take the balloon and cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperatures? Well, let's see. First off, this balloon is too big. It shouldn't fit in the box. But if we kind of hold it above the liquid nitrogen and just give it a sec, 
we see I can feel it now just starting to deflate a little bit. Yeah, might be able to see it now on the camera deflating just a bit. It's got a lot less pressure in there now. Got to get my tongs ready. And yep, yeah, now we see that the balloon is fully deflated in the liquid nitrogen. So this balloon has been cooled down to about negative 200 degrees Celsius. And now it fits in what it previously didn't fit in before. Okay, so you might have thought, ah, oh, no, you're tricking me here. You just popped the balloon. Well, what happens if we suddenly heat it back up by bringing it back to room temperature? Well, here's your balloon back. We'll leave it down there and let's take a look. Here, I'll, so you can hear it. I'll hold my mic up to it. We see it just begin to, oh no, it did actually burst. That happens sometimes. That's okay. That's why I have a backup. So close. <laughs> it happens. It, it's rare that it bursts, but it does happen sometimes. It gets stressed when it's frozen that cold. But let's give the second one a shot. That's why I always have a backup there ready to go. We'll hold up the mic so we can hear that one again. And we'll see if that expands. Yeah. So we see that's just as it's warming up, the balloon expands. It's going from this ultra cold temperature back to room temperature. And it looks like it's inflating itself, but it's just changing temperature over a range of about 200 degrees Celsius. Okay, let's give that a little bit of a flip. You can still see it's frozen on the other side. And now that that's exposed to air. Oh! Didn't see that one coming. That was fun. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. I skipped a piece. Let me go back here for a sec. Okay. So this is not the only property that can change when we cool things down to these kind of extreme temperatures. We can also think about electrical conductivity. So you might have heard something about conductors and insulators before. Uh, a conductor is something that allows electricity to go through it, and an insulator is something that does not allow electricity to go through it. So for example, uh, rubber is an insulator. If I put rubber around a wire, that's going to keep me from getting an electric shock when I touch the wire. But copper is a very good conductor of electricity. Other things like gold are even better conductors of electricity, and things like aluminum are okay conductors of electricity. But what happens if we change the temperature of the conductor as well? So here I have a lamp, and this lamp is connected to this large copper spool. Okay, so this is just a big chunk of copper wire. Now, copper is a good conductor. But there is a lot of copper here that that electricity has to go through. So it's encountering a lot of electrical resistance. The current can't flow freely through it. But if I cool it down to negative 200 degrees Celsius, the resistance of the metal should decrease. And we might be able to see that on this light bulb. So I'm going to put this into the liquid nitrogen. Because essentially what I'm doing is I'm putting in a very, very hot piece of copper relative to the electric sorry relative to the liquid nitrogen inside the inside it it'll start to boil rapidly i'll hold my mic up so that you can hear it okay hopefully you can hear that boiling okay so that's because liquid nitrogen is boiling as i put in that room temperature piece of copper and we see my light bulb very very quickly gets much 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 brighter Okay, still boiling, so it's not fully at liquid nitrogen temperature yet, and it's still getting even brighter and brighter and brighter. It's actually starting to hurt to look at a little bit. So things can change when we cool them down to incredibly low temperatures. Not just does balloons inflate, but also other properties like electrical conductivity. Take that back out. We can see a lot of steam coming on this because this is really at ice, 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 like more than ice cold temperatures, about negative 200 Celsius. Okay. Okay, so as the behavior, as the temperature changes, the behavior of these things start to change as well. We call this a phase transition. And one example of this is the transition to what we call superconductivity. Okay, so superconductivity, what that means is that it's not just that the copper has low resistance, it actually has zero resistance, absolutely no resistance whatsoever. Okay, and some weird things start to happen at that point. One thing that happens is called the Meissner effect. What happens is that when we cool down these objects down to incredibly low temperatures, 
they no longer have any electrical resistance. And what we see is that they actually expel any magnetic field. If you bring a magnet next to them, they will come up with a magnetic field to match that magnet so that they can physically remove it. They can basically have no magnetic field permeating through them whatsoever. They are you know, screening out any other possible magnetic fields. Okay, this is something that only happens when you cool things down so much that they have absolutely zero electrical resistance. So let's go back to the demo bench and see how this works. So I'm going to just move my old lamp out of here as it warms itself back up. And I'm going to grab my superconductors. So this right here is a piece of superconductor. It's made of a, uh, oh, sorry, let's get it out of the shadow there. Yeah. So it's made of something called uh, gadolinium barium copper oxide, GBCO. And this is a material that becomes superconducting at liquid nitrogen temperatures. Now, most materials that go superconducting, you actually need to get even colder. I'm talking about like negative 270 degrees Celsius. But we're lucky that some materials like this one become superconducting at higher temperatures. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to pop it into my liquid nitrogen. I'm going to pop a second one there as a backup. And what I have here is a very, very strong magnet. So we see that I have this strong circular shaped magnet here and this strong square shaped magnet here. So if I cool these down to superconducting temperature, well, they're not going to like seeing this magnetic field. I put them in a magnetic field, they're going to find a way to repel it. So let's see what happens when I bring my superconductor, they're almost cooled down now, and put it in the big magnetic field. Okay, so I'll just fish that out with my tongs. Oh, come on, where are you? Always a little bit of fun to find them. There we go. Okay, so there it is. See a liquid nitrogen running around a bit. Ooh, got a little in my pants. And now what I do is I just bring it near the magnetic field. And what we see right there is that the puck floats right on top. The superconducting puck floats right on top of the magnet. Okay, even if I hold it upside down, it's locked in right there. Actually, one second. Let me fix the lighting a bit. We don't need it to be dark anymore. I'll be back in two seconds. We can get a closer look. There we go. Hopefully that's a little clearer now. We don't need to see electrons anymore. We can see this puck that just kind of floats directly over that magnet. See, I give it a little push, and it's really wanting to stay right over top of that. Even if I turn it upside down, it remains floating in the magnet. It has a magnetic field that matches the magnetic field of the big bar magnet and keeps it locked in place. If I put it on this magnet here that has circular symmetry, it's going to similarly want to stay in place. But because the magnet has circular symmetry, the puck will be happy to spin in the direction of the circular symmetry, still floating up there. See that? It's spinning, but it's floating. Yeah, so this is, a, this is super conductivity at work. Okay, we'll leave that floating there for a sec, just kind of spinning by its own accord. Okay. Okay, so what we saw so far, and I think we can get the, I'll leave my face back up on the screen because we'll be showing some things on the little, little camera before we get to the final demo. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, what we see in all of these demos is that as we cool things down, exciting and useful things can happen. So we actually do have to get to about negative 273 Celsius to use superconductors for quantum computing. So this is one of the labs where they use superconducting quantum bits. So I have one of them right here. We can see it's like this little shiny piece of metal here. It's hard to see what's going on on the camera, but this is a this is what the actual layout looks like. That's where they have two superconducting quantum bits, so the fundamental building blocks of a quantum computer. They put them in these white tubes back here. They're called dilution refrigerators. Cool them down to about 10 millikelvin, so 0 0.0, sorry, 0.01 Kelvin above absolute zero. Very, very cold stuff. You start seeing quantum effects at that point, and you can use them to build a quantum computer, a computer that obeys the rules of quantum mechanics. Now, the other thing you can think about doing is going even, even colder and actually trapping cold atoms. 
Okay, so this is what we call a magneto optical trap. It's where you actually use laser beams to trap atoms in a very specific point. So it's an ultra high vacuum system like that. Lasers are shined through all these windows. And this is a GIF of one of those magneto optical traps. Each of these, this little cloud right here is actually a few million atoms of cesium that are trapped at the center there. So we're talking you know, a lot of atoms, but not a lot compared to the amount of atoms we're used to dealing with. Okay, so this is how we can isolate a lot of atoms using lasers. How can we isolate just one though? And what I'm, the last demo I want to show you is how we isolate atoms using electrical charge. So if you've seen electrical charge before, you know that if I have an electric charge, well, I can move it around in an electric field. So let's say for now that I'm able to trap a single, a single positively charged atom in an electric field like this. So I make sure that it's trapped in one place. Now, what happens if I try to bring another positively charged atom towards it? Well, we should know that two uh, opposite charges, they attract to each other, but two of the same charge, they repel. So maybe the electric fields are trying to push them together, but if I add atoms, they're not going to want to be in the same spot. They're going to repel each other because of their electric charge. And in this way, I can get an isolated line of atoms one after the other okay so i'm going to show you one more final demo and for that we're going to use something called a linear paul trap so it looks something like this so inside this trap we have four razor blades and that those are what are going to give us our electric field that traps the atoms in the center okay for technical reasons uh, in order to make this work we need to use alternating current so the kind of uh wave current that we get from the wall we can't do it directly all the time so they're actually trapped in these little micro orbits called micro motion so what we have to the right of me over here is a setup that does exactly that so this a little bit more hooked up and let's take a peek at what we see there on the camera so i'm not going to get my face in there so uh we'll have to leave me up on that side so i can find out what's going oh uh sorry just got to get the right camera there there we go so we're gonna shine a laser beam in there. So something that looks exactly like this, we're just shining a laser beam through the middle here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to power up my uh, electric field. Actually, first, let's see what happens. So I have the electric field off right now. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some charged atoms in there. So here I have what's called lycopodium powder. And I'm going to charge up my straw by just rubbing it with the proper cloth, a microfiber cloth. Now I put in my lycopodium powder and what I'm doing is this powder on the end is now has an electric charge. If I pop it into my device, well, we see it just quickly falls through the cloud. But now I'm gonna repeat that. And first I'm going to increase my electric field and well, didn't even need to pop in more. We got some that immediately got trapped in the trap. So this is being trapped by electric fields and we see that they also repel themselves from each other. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to release, reduce the power of the trap a bit so that we lose some. And now we can eventually end up in a situation where we have maybe just a few ions trapped there at any one time. In this case, we have maybe eight or nine trapped in there right now. Now that's what we want. We're going to be able to trap just a few so we can actually control them and use them to build quantum computers. Now, if I turn it way up, I might be able to get a ton in there. And this is really cool. I actually formed something called a trap NATO here. It's a little tornado of ions that kind of swirl around each other. Really cool for looking at, unfortunately not super useful for building quantum computers. Nonetheless, glad we got to show that in action. So what we have here is a bunch of trapped ions this time made of powder, but in the real lab, we'll make them one atom at a time. Okay, so you can see an image from the real lab here. So last time we were just talking about little clumps of powder. This lab actually does it with individual trapped ytterbium atoms. So each of these dots really does correspond to one single atom. And they do it using lasers and kind of more advanced versions of the same tool that we used to trap powder. You can also do some really cool stuff with lasers. So this is a, a group from Harvard and they're able to trap rubidium atoms. And you can see that they used it to generate a little cartoon of Mario stomping on a Goomba. And by just rearranging them, we can change what the interactions the quantum system has and use that to construct new kinds of algorithms.
Okay. With that, so those are some of the tools that we use to develop quantum information science. This is a field that uses a whole lot of different fields of research. So myself, I'm a physicist. I love physics. But if you're interested in the computer science, the mathematics, the cryptography, the chemistry, the engineering of this, we are looking for people interested in these sorts of ideas and applying them in all different kinds of applications. Things like computing, things like communication systems, sensors, materials, and just understanding the foundations of why any of this works in the first place. Just we know that quantum mechanics is the most successful uh, ru most successful uh, rule book in physics that we have to develop new experiments. But what does it all mean? Can we understand it more by thinking about information in quantum systems? That's some of the work that we do here. With that, I'd like to wish you a very happy World Quantum Day. Thank you so much for joining us today. And I am more than happy to hang around and answer any questions. Fantastic. We'll go a little longer than our usual program, and that's fine. Oh, if you stick around with us, we'll, we'll be rebels together. But thank you so, so much for that, John. And you have it up on the screen here. I'll highlight again the Institute for Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo. Check out their website, their Instagram page below. So much more to discover. You can't possibly talk about quantum uh, physics in, in one 40-minute broadcast and, and cover the, the gamut, but I love the chance to see some cool experiments in action. Uh, Miss Easton, Miss Gully, if you want to let me know in the chat if you are good to go for questions, I know you might need to head off to next periods and whatnot, but we've got a ton of questions that came in on YouTube while we were going there, John. And so one, I'm sure all our students, whether grade 6, grade 12, are interested in Mr. Ferguson's class. How many years of studying do you have to do to be able to do this job? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it varies a lot. If you want to be something like a research professor, that is a long time. We're talking PhD and then doing a whole lot of postdocs to like run a lab like that. Uh, but there are opportunities for people to just kind of jump in, even right out of undergrad. Uh, this is a growing uh field. So right now, a lot of the jobs are looking for people with PhDs. That won't be the case in five to 10 years from now when people are going to be, when a lot of this, uh, you know, we'll need people who are just interested in programming these devices who don't necessarily need to have that full research experience. We really are building these up from the ground right now. Uh, so we need people who understand the, the bits of the building blocks, but that's going to change very soon. Fantastic. You actually answered some other questions on YouTube with that answer. So thank you for that. Perfect. Uh, Miss Gully, you're right at the camera. So I'm going to come to you if you have any questions for us or anything before you head off. Uh, oh, we did. Negative. Oh, there we go. I can come back and check it in a minute. We got a whole bunch on YouTube. So uh, are we able to do any of these experiments at home? If someone wanted to do any of these things, do they have the technology and toys to do that or not? <laughs> yeah, no, it depends on what you want to do. So liquid nitrogen is sometimes hard to get at home. You can get it at science centers sometimes, though. So keep an eye out for that. If you're if you're if you're a teacher, you can maybe work out something with a local university or with a science center. But there are experiments you can do at home, especially if you're just able to get your hand on a laser pointer. If you want to see that double slit interference, there's really not much to it. One of my favorite experiments to do at home is to use a laser pointer and shine it over one of your hairs. And if you shine it over the hair, it kind of goes one way around the hair, one way around the other side. You can see an interference pattern very similar to the double slit. And if you do the math right, you can use that to infer how wide your hair actually is. Uh, so I highly recommend just Google measuring the width of your hair with a laser pointer. You'll turn up something there. That's a really good experiment you can do at home very related. Very to cool, John. I'll need to get a laser pointer. I've got the hair. We're ready and happy to in there. I'm going to order from Amazon when we're done. Um, another question from online. How have you ever used a quantum computer? I mean, how do they work differently from regular computers? I know we talked a little bit about this mm -hmm. at the beginning. It might be a very complicated answer, but anything you want to share with us? And uh, have you used one? Yeah. So uh, the whether or not I've used a quantum okay. computer depends on who you ask a bit. We have a lot of what I would call quantum computing devices. So these are kind of like rudimentary quantum computers. They don't, you can't use them the same way that you use a regular computer because we don't have that many bits. You know, a regular computer, we're talking about, you know, gigabytes of RAM. Here we're talking about five to 50 quantum bits. So you can do some interesting things on these that are different than classical computers, but you can't do things like run programs the way we traditionally think about it. That being said, I have played around with them. You can too. A lot of them are available for cloud access. A lot of companies do run this. One I will note is probably the first one to release a cloud computer was IBM. You can find uh, their programming language. It's all run entirely through Python. They also have some drag and drop versions of it on their website as well. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, you won't be able to run something that performs better than any classical computer. Uh, those are still research tools, but uh, you can definitely play around with some of uh, how this works.
and we'll see with the technology getting better and better and more accessible. Exactly. And this is the case with all technology. Soon enough, well, uh, my kids will probably be able to do all sorts of quantum computing things uh, when I have them. Uh, and, exactly. And, we have uh, uh, we the way we get there. Eventually, we'll be able to use quantum computers without knowing we're using quantum computers. The same way that I'm able to use this computer without knowing everything about how transistors work and all that kind of stuff, yeah. we're able to just use it. Quantum computers are still at the point where, yeah, when we use them, we have to understand a bit about how the transistors and stuff work, but that won't be the case in the future. Very, very cool. Thanks, John. Um, all right, I'm going to take a few more questions from online. Are photons dangerous to humans? Ah, uh, many photons are dangerous to humans. If I have, uh, you know, a million trillion photons and shine them in my life from a laser, that's going to hurt. But individual photons, no, they're incredibly low energy. Uh, you know, no, they're they're not super dangerous whatsoever. Even those kind of like dangerous regimes of electromagnetic radiation, think like X-rays and gamma rays. One photon's not going to hurt you. It's a lot of photons, like a big bright beam that's going to hurt you. Interesting. Very cool. Actually, on the note of gamma rays, photons. So uh, help me out here. Yeah. Uh, with gamma rays, it's not like sheer volume of things. It's like they literally, each photon would have more energy associated with it than an X-ray and then so on yeah. down the line. And that was does make it. Is each photon, each individual photon does have more energy. Still yeah. one photon itself isn't dangerous. Uh, it's the whole collection of photons that is dangerous. Fascinating. Gamma rays are more dangerous per photon, for sure, to be clear. Well, yeah, that's where, that's where I guess I've always sort of thought of them as a wave more than a yeah. particle. I've never actually conceived of a gamma ray particle photon, yeah. but that's uh, odd. Anyway, when you get into the, the weeds of physics, it ends up being endlessly <laughs> fascinating and very, very strange, and uh, I'm glad I got to illustrate some of that today. Uh, John, various variations on most interesting or favorite part of your job. Anything that jumps out? Yeah. Uh, so... Thinking about my kind of the kind of research half of my job, the most interesting thing that I find about that is just that they let me get away with it, to be honest. <laughs> they let me spend my entire day hanging out in a lab with a giant kit of Lego pieces. Uh, like they kind of look like Lego pieces, lenses and mirrors and all that kind of thing. And then somehow I get to build up my own big experiment. And at the end of the day, learn something about quantum mechanics, learn something about what quantum entanglement is, learn something about how we can measure weird properties of photons. Uh, and, you know, uh, there are applications of all of this. Honestly, I'm just happy they let me play around with the physics. <laughs> you're illustrating perfectly my introduction where you're like one of the most enthusiastic guys we ever have on. But really, <laughs> I think it's going by the seat of your pants. Like it's, it's a litany of people who like get to pinch themselves daily with the luck of getting the job to do that they do. So I'm glad we get to, to highlight that today. Um, I'm going to take one last question and then I'll highlight, uh, again, some more resources to keep the learning going, an upcoming program with you guys at the IQC. Uh, but I do love this one and I think the answer is an obvious yes, but if you want to milk it for as long as yeah. you can, is a career in the quantum field something worth considering in the future? Absolutely, absolutely. So there's, as mentioned, there's a lot of ways to get into the quantum field. This is a very much a growing field. If we look at kind of what's going on in the field right now, uh, from like a government perspective, the Canadian government very recently announced a $360 million national quantum strategy. If we look at global investments in specifically quantum information technology, it's something like estimated around the neighborhood of $30 billion that's been invested in the last 15 years or so. There's a lot of money in this this field, a lot of need for people with those talents. And even if you think to yourself, hey, I don't know about this quantum thing, when you learn about quantum uh, information science, you are becoming a very strong expert in uh, in your field of physics, in computer science in general. If you want to understand how quantum algorithms work, you better be an expert in how algorithms work in the first place. Uh, I always highly recommend trying to find higher education, trying to really absorb yourself in a problem. You'll pick up a ton of skills along the way. This field is growing, but you'll have so many applicable skills for literally any field, even remotely connected to your field of interest. It feels like coding did when I was a boy. Exactly. When I was a kid, coding came out and we were like, oh, coding, you know, that might not be for me. That's so technical, it's so challenging. And now, like, it's taught in schools. It's everyone. There's major organizations all across Canada that highlight this. And it's a really exciting time in science. We have quantum science. We have artificial intelligence. We have better and bigger space exploration. We've got amazing things in the conservation field. I mean, it's just the coolest time to be interested in tinkering and playing around and learning that there's ever been. Uh, and I always like the chance to, to talk with you about all these great opportunities. So thank you so much, John. This has been My great. My pleasure. Well, I will note again, iqc.ca, uh, quantum underscore iqc on Instagram if you want to see more of the amazing stuff they got on there. I'm going to go check out the teleportation thing right after we're done, uh, just because that sounds like a lot of fun. And 
Now, last year, John, you joined us twice, and this year you've passed the torch a little bit for our May 16th program, Photons in Space with Dr. Tanya Kuntz. Uh, I really encourage you to come check us out. It's not on our newsletter or website yet, but we're looking so very forward to having a second IQC presentation for another special day in a little over a month. John, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you so, so much. Have a wonderful day, and uh, we really appreciate you joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.